Greetings, beloved. I am Antoinette Bolden. Thank you for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast with Brother Hawk Bolden and I. We pray that during this message, the Holy Spirit will open up God's truth to you and you will receive deliverance in every area of your life. For the word declares in John 8 and 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So stay tuned and be blessed by today's message. We thank God for you all being here and uh, everyone that's listening in, of course, we thank God for you as well. And it's, it's a blessing to, uh, to uh, just be able to share in the word of the Lord and share with the song as well with you all. All right, so last uh, Thursday, I wanted to say Tuesday, <laughs> but last Thursday, we started on a series called The Principles of Ezra. And these are some things that the Lord want us to learn uh, and, and some things that God want us to see here. So if you have, and we left off at, at the, we went through the first chapter of the book of Ezra. Of course, we gave a little history lesson on uh, during this time period. Now, this is the time period, uh, maybe some 500 years before Jesus Christ come to the world in flesh, I should say and uh, was born into the world. And um, if you know, of course, your history, you, you, you know that uh, 400 years had passed between the Old Testament and New Testament before God spoke to mankind again. And of course, he, the first time he began to speak to mankind was in the form of John the Baptist, you see. And so uh, this is to help us to understand where people were that God in his, with his own creation had gotten silent for 400 years, didn't say anything. Now, if you remember, when John the Baptist came on the scene, the people were still having church. Jesus, when he taught, he taught in the synagogues. People were still meeting there. But 400 years had passed without God saying a word. <laughs> people were still preaching. But God wasn't talking, you see. <laughs> and so <laughs> that ought to get us to thinking about something. Just because the church has its doors open don't mean that God is talking. Everybody understand? Through that particular church or through that particular preacher. Everybody see? And so people go right on having church and, and doing all of these things and not hearing from God. One of the things that we read about in... Uh, book of 1 Corinthians, uh, talking about the gift of prophecy. And, 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 and uh, one of the things that's pointed out in that, in that book is that when prophecy goes forth, the people, the unbelievers, will say of surety that God is among you. And so, in other words, why? Because things in their hearts are being called out and, and things like that. And so, uh, today, people go to church living in sin and nothing's being bothered. They're not bothered at all. They're comfortable. Uh, and, and when people get comfortable, they, let me make this clear. There's no way you can go before a holy God and, and be comfortable living in sin. Amen. No way. And so if you're going to a church and you're living in sin and, and you're comfortable, it's because the holiness of God isn't there. That's the only reason why. If you are not being challenged to, to grow in the Lord and, and God isn't hitting those things that you got going on in your life that's not of him, he's not there, you see. And, and so uh, we just want to bring these things out, you see, that God sent his ministers uh, to call out things in people. Not because he hates you. We're talking about God now. But because he loves you and he don't want you to lose your soul behind you playing with sin. Uh, we're going to keep saying this. You can live without sin. And it's a doctrine from hell that says you can't. That's like saying, I, I, I'm, I'm just on my way to hell, you know, and there's nothing I can do about it. No, you can stop living in sin. You see, we're going to touch this here in the next coming weeks uh, in the sixth chapter of the book of Jeremiah. In fact, let's just let's go there right now. The sixth chapter of the book of Jeremiah.
And uh, we're going to start reading at verse 1, the sixth chapter of the book of Jeremiah. It says, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire in Beth Chorazin. For evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her. They shall pitch their tents against her round about. They shall feed everyone in his place. Prepare ye war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe unto us for the day goeth away for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Now what is Jeremiah doing? He's prophesying against the cities and telling them basically what's going to happen, that there are going to be some kings from the north that's going to come and, and they're going to make war against the children of Israel. And, of course, we're, he's going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, why? It says, verse 5, Arise and let us go by night and let us destroy her palaces. Now, he's, saying, he's telling the people what the mindset of these kings are going to be in these armies. Verse 6, For thus said the Lord of hosts, for thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is, this is the city to be visited. She is holy op oppression in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her water, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Now, what's going on here? God is basically saying he's sick and tired of, of folks living in sin and, and living in the wounds of their sin, you see. And so now he has to judge it. And that's his way of, of purging sin out. Now, if you don't willfully give up sin, then God has a way of purging it out. And that's a process that you don't want to go through, you see. Now, I'm going to tell you, one of two things are going to happen. And, and the Lord has showed me this in times past. And, and some of you may have seen it happen or may have even, in, even experienced it yourself. Yourselves. Uh, what happens uh, uh, in times past when God have sent me to somebody to warn them, I mean particularly about what they were doing in their life, he will let me know one of two things are going to happen. Either they're going to repent and, and turn or either their hearts are going to get hardened even more so against them. Why? Because if you don't receive warning from God and, and repent of your sins, then what happens is things begin to happen in your life that God has sent designed to pull you out of that sin. But oftentimes you don't learn the lesson. You see, if you don't just receive a verbal warning, you see, from God, then what happens is he sends things into your life. He allows things to go on and people become bitter more bitter against God. Now, they, they you know, tend to, to take it out on the preacher that God may have sent. But people become bitter against God, you see. And so it makes it harder on them. And they become hard. And this whole world is full of people who God have warned over and over again. And the more they turn down those warnings, the more hardened their hearts get towards God. And then the more easily they accept sin into their lives, which is why you have so many church people in in church today. So many people in church today making excuses for sin. They do that because God have already hardened their hearts. Everybody understand what happens uh, when you turn down the warnings from God himself, then that's you hardening your heart. But pretty soon what has started happening is God will start hardening it. Why? Because he want that time to be fulfilled of your Persian, either you're going to accept it or you, or, or you just go on off into perdition. And then thinking that you're right. What happens, according to the word of God in the book of Romans, he will turn you over to a reprobate mind. You see, that's why we don't argue this word. We just preach it. Now, you're going to either believe it or you're not going to believe it. But I've learned... You don't argue with reprobate minds. They'll never, ever see it. Never. And, and I, I'm telling you, you know, the Lord sent me to a preacher one time to, to warn him. And, you know, now 
in the vision that I had, I, I saw myself standing face to face with this preacher. And, and the Lord was standing right on side of me, telling me what to tell him. And so, of course, I, I don't understand it. So I asked, Lord, you standing right here. You just as close to him as I am. Why am I the one that's being sent to warn him? Why, you know, why don't you just talk to him? And the Lord spoke something that broke my heart. He said, he, he's been at a place where he couldn't hear from me. You see? And I think that's a sad place to be in. You call yourself a preacher and, and you get into a place where you can't hear from God because, you know, for different reasons. And, I, and, I, you know, and, and then it made me wonder, how many people are in that place? Now, you let this preacher tell you he thought he was hearing from God on a daily basis. But the Lord standing right on side of me said, no, I, I better stop talking to him. That's why the Lord have prophets. You see, prophets are the mouthpiece of God. They know his mind. And when you think about it, you know, I, every prophet that I've ever known personally, they were very, very old fashioned. They seem like they're supposed to have been living a thousand years ago. You see, and, and, and God make them that way. Why? Because God, when God places one in the midst of people, it's to call them back. They don't go along with society and what society have going on it is to call his people back to him. That's what they're sent for, you see. And so oftentimes people get offended at that. And so I began to talk with this preacher, and I'm in the vision now. Begin to talk with him about what the law was telling me to tell him. And while I was talking to him, there was a cup that came from heaven. Like I, I saw a big hand. It was the hand of God with a cup. It like something like a coffee cup and the the cup was extended to him to drink of it and and the more I talked the closer the cup got to him but the more I talked the further away he backed up from me and then after talking for a little while I saw him begin to try to debate with me and then the Lord spoke to me and said stop talking don't say anything else to him he said, because if you try to convince him and keep going, he's just going to back up on into perdition. So just leave him alone. Don't don't say anything else to him. And that's what I did. I just left just left him alone. And so I had to go to this preacher physically. So, you know, and tell him what the Lord told me to tell him. And it happened just like the Lord said. He began to argue with me or try to. And, you know, and then I just remember what the Lord said. Don't argue back with him. Don't try to you know, show him anything in the word, just let him go, you know, that, because the more you talk to him, the harder his heart is going to get. I tell you, a, a bad place to be in is to think that you're hearing from God and the whole time you're hearing from another spirit. Now, what is the litmus test from hearing from God? When it lines up with his word, God is not going to tell you anything that, that's going to go against his word. Amen. You see? And we, we have people who cause a, a, a ruckus and, 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 you know, and act ugly towards other people and the whole time think that God is with them. And no, God is not with you. You, you cannot go against God's word and then still have God with you. you you're deceived. And so you have to let people go through this deal that they, that they go through when they reject God's word. God doesn't take it lightly when people reject his word. You see, he, he doesn't take that lightly. He judged a whole nation. I, I, you think about this, a whole nation. What we're reading here was judged because people, you know, just refused to, to hearken to the Lord. Now, these were adults that were doing this. But they little children had to suffer right along with them, had to go down into captivity with them. Everybody see? And so when we reject God's word, it's not only us that suffer. Children suffer. Innocent people that are involved in your life will suffer. And we see a prime example of that in the book of Jonah. When, when Jonah disobeyed God and, and went in the opposite direction of where he told him to go to, 
what did Jonah do? He got on that ship and God sent a strong wind and, and waves to beat against that ship to the, so much so that the people were crying out and they were telling everybody, you pray to your gods, whatever God you serve, you pray. Now, here's the thing about it. God only wanted one individual on that ship. But since they were harboring <laughs> a fugitive, God said, okay, I'll make all of you pay. What does that mean? You can be in the company of people who God have set his face against. Now, the Bible makes it, makes it clear. Be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's not just talking about being married to them. That, you know, when you walk with unbelievers, people that don't believe this word, you are giving them your okay to go to hell. Now, that's just what it all boils down to, you see. And so Jonah caused, caused all of these people to suffer because of his disobedience. And he knew who it was. He knew it. And so that's what he told them. Look, I'm the problem. If, if you throw me overboard, you see, then it's all, all of this will cease. Y'all can just go on with your little trip wherever you're going and uh, enjoy yourself. But the people did exactly what folks do today. No, Jonah, we're not going to throw you over. We're just going to pray harder. And many people get involved with folks and have folks in their lives. And, they, and they, the devil is causing a ruckus in their life. And God is sending strong winds into your life. And instead of you thinking, you know, this didn't happen until I got mixed up with you. We don't think that way. No, what we think is, I just need to pray more. I need to fast more. You know, that, that's why I'm under such an attack. No, what you need to do is obey the word. You don't, you don't fellowship with unbelievers. You see, you try to get them saved. Because here's the thing you have to know. The Bible tells us in the book of Amos, how can two walk together except they be agreed? When you walk with unbelievers, it's because you, you again, you're giving them your okay that you believe them or that you go along with what they believe. Now what happens is you end up finding out the hard way later on down the road that they can't be the kind of friend that you think you want. Why? Because there's no loyalty among unbelievers. I, I don't care how you look at it. Ultimately, folks that are, that are on the outside of Christ, they're only looking out for number one. Everybody else is a distant second, you see. And so God sends his ministers to warn people of these things. Now, the, the question is, do we take heed to what God has warned us of? You see, do we do that? Here we see in this, in this scripture, let's keep reading here. Verse 8, it says, Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus said the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine, Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak? Give warning that they may hear. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Everybody see. And so what is, what is God saying? That he sent his preachers to people. They have ears where they can hear naturally so, but their ears are uncircumcised. Meaning it's not set apart for holiness. If you're listening to all other kind of stuff, you know, and, and you're accepting all other kind of stuff, you have uncircumcised ears, and so it makes it hard for you to receive gospel truth. That's why it's important that we, we cut all of these things out that doesn't have anything to do with God, that, that, in, that harms our spiritual growth. You see, you've heard that, that statement, you take uh, two steps forward and one step back, and that's what happens when you include a lot of stuff in your life that shouldn't be there, you see. You, you can go full force and full charge in the Lord, f you know, full speed ahead in God, and, and then when you dabble in the world, it's just like you're going backwards. And eventually what happens is you just remain in the same place. You're not growing spiritually, you know, and, and, and you're getting frustrated. And eventually what happens, you just take on the mindset of nobody's perfect. I'm right where I am. Let me make this clear. If you're the same person that you were a year ago, something's wrong. Something's wrong if you're the same individual you were a year ago and you're calling yourself a Christian. 
as long as, as we're in this flesh, we're going to have room to grow. And, and the Lord will continue to reveal things to us. But listen, you have to know your ABCs before you can write a book. Amen. What do I mean? You have to accept this little stuff, this, this elementary stuff, before God moves you past in, in, into other things. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you reject the elementary stuff? If you can reject the idea of being perfect, that, that's where you'll stay, right there. If, if you think it's okay to lie and to backbite, that's exactly where you'll stay. In other words, when you make excuses for sin, you'll just continue to live there. And then you won't grow. There's no way to grow, you know, if, if you think you can't live without sin. You see? And so God wants the best for us. And unfortunately, when we reject the ministers of God and, and the word of God in its purest form, we don't receive God's best. And we're not talking about houses. We're not talking about lands. We're not talking about, we're talking about spiritually so. Walking in a place that God have called you to walk in. Many people miss out on the blessings of God because they're toying around with sin. You see? Many people, God is calling you out. And, and that is the theme of the book of Ezra. A remnant was called out of Babylon. In other words, out of bondage. Listen, before they could start building a temple in Jerusalem, they had to leave bondage. Before you could move into the things that God have called you to build, you got to be delivered from sin. You have to leave sin behind. Amen. But many people, they, you know what they do? They build a temple to God right in Babylon. Hmm. And think God is going to meet them there. No, God's not meeting you in Babylon. Jerusalem is the center place of worship. That's where he's going to meet you. So what, what, what am I saying? God is going to meet you when he don't have to be looking at sin. That's where he meets you at. Everybody understand? That's where those promises are. God is such a good God that he, he shows us, you know, uh, what he wants us to do personally. If we'll seek him, he'll reveal those things to us of where we're going in him. But you know what? Those things don't come automatic. They don't come automatic. And, and, and you know, <laughs> God spoke something to me uh, this weekend, this, this weekend, almost isn't good enough with him. You are either holy or you're not. Folks don't almost go to heaven. <laughs> if you go, it's going to be on purpose. You're not, it's not, it, heaven is not a place that you just stumble upon and find and thank God I'm here. No, everybody that's in heaven today, they're there because they wanted to be there, because they made preparation to be there, you see. But if we are dabbling in sin, and if we are continually uh, uh, living in sin, there's no way we're going to reach those things that God wants us to reach. My wife and I, we were just having a discussion this morning about Samson. One of the saddest stories in the Bible that you'll ever read. Samson, the strongest man, as far as we know, that ever lived. You see, physically so, naturally strong. And that strength came to him because of the anointing. Again, let's point this out. When the people saw Samson, you know, you, you, if you see the movie about Samson, you see some big muscle-bound man. But that wasn't so. When the people saw Samson, there was nothing about him that made you think he could pick up these big old boulders and, and whoop a whole army with his bare hands. So there was nothing about him that made you think, you know. So in other words, what was God uh, uh, showing us? That his strength was made perfect in weakness. He wanted, when he raised Samson up, he wanted the people to understand. It's not because Samson is going to the gym five days a week. That he's able to do this. In other words, it's not in his own strength. It's because my anointing is on him. And many people, 
God have a plan for their lives? If God allowed you to be born, let's make this clear, he has a plan for you. But you don't reach that full potential playing in sin. Samson, one of the most anointed men that you'll read about in the Bible, he was the ruler of a whole nation, a judge of a whole nation, and he didn't have an army to back him up. He was a one-man army, and folks were afraid of him, you see. And so the devil said, you know, I can't get him by uh, sending an army of a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand because some kind of way he's going to find a way to whip them. But you know how I will do it? I will work on the inside of him. I will work on the inside. In other words, let, let's think about this. The devil, in the book of Genesis, what we read in the book of Genesis, the third chapter, he couldn't come, and now he was already cast out of heaven, and he couldn't come against mankind and, and just forcefully overtake mankind. But he, he did something very slick. Now, in, in the Bible, uh, it's called the, the doctrine of Balaam. And we'll get, we'll get there in just a second. What was that? I can't, outside of you, do anything to come against you and whoop you as long as God is with you. But I can make you just as much of an enemy as God, of God as I am by getting you to disobey his word. And if I get you to disobey his word, that automatically sets God against you. Everybody understand? And so Samson was a one-man army that the devil could not whip. He couldn't raise up an army to whoop Samson. And so what did he do? He got Samson to compromise. Yeah, Samson, it's okay. We thank you again for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast. Prayerfully, this message has better equipped you for your spiritual journey. To request your free copy of this message in its entirety, or if you would like to submit a prayer request, you may write to God's Truth and Deliverance, Post Office Box 23504, Nashville, Tennessee 37202. Or you may submit your request by calling and leaving a message at 615-530-6138. Tune in next week, same station, same time, for more of God's truth and deliverance. Be blessed.